If you have your Bibles, cell phones, iPads, whatever you use to read the scripture, I want you to hold them up and you know what we're going to do. I want you to say this loud and clear like you mean it with all your heart. Say, this is my Bible. This is my Bible. If, it, it, in it are 66 books. In it are 66 books. Written by 40 different authors. Written by 40 different authors. Its words are God breathed. Its words are God breathed. And God inspired. And God inspired. It is God's owner's manual. It is God's owner's manual. For my life. For my life. And if I read it every day. It will change my life. It will, my life. It will, transform, me it will transform me into the image of Jesus Christ. Of Jesus Christ. Therefore, I choose to love it, I to love it and, cherish it and cherish it all the days of my life. Of my life. In, Jesus In Jesus' name. Now turn to the person next to you and say, read your Bible every day. <clears throat> So, we're going to continue on, as I said, in our series called Wake Up, Stand Up, Speak Up. And uh, today we're going to be looking at Daniel the prophet. And so before we get started, I want to remind you that this series, what this series is really all about. In Romans chapter 12, verse 2, the Bible clearly tells us, do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And so this is a warning, you guys, to all of us that the world system, which is in rebellion against God, will try to get you to conform to it. Amen? Amen. And as we see today, many people... Uh, are bowing down to the world system, so to speak. Even many who have called themselves Christians are bowing to the world systems. And the Apostle Paul then tells us uh, not to be conformed, but to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Being transformed is completely opposite of being conformed to this world, isn't it? The transformation process takes us away from the system of this world. We, we live in this world, but we're not to be of this world. Does that make sense? Amen. If it doesn't, see me after church and I'll explain it to you. So the way we get transformed is by simply reading our Bible every day, coming to church, and getting involved in the church and serving in the church and fellowshipping uh, with your brothers and sisters in the Lord. That's how you become transformed, by, by laying down your life for Jesus Christ and now changing the direction of your life. You gave yourself over to the Lord and asked him to be your Lord and Savior. Now, at that moment, the transformation process begins. And in order to continue being transformed until you get to go home and be with Jesus and live with him forever, you need to lay down your life every single day and say, Lord, help me to become more like you. Amen? Amen. I don't know, maybe you guys didn't drink enough coffee this morning or something. Amen. Can we get them some, can, can, you, can, can we get some coffee in these folks today? Can you say amen this morning? Amen. So, 1 Thessalonians 5.11 says to encourage each other and build each other up. Encourage, some translations say encourage one another and build each other up. And so when we hang out with like-minded people that love God more than they love the things of this world, uh, we can glean from one another, right? We can be encouraged by one another. And so we talk about the Lord and what the Lord has done in our life and our past and what he's doing currently in our life. And we have all these conversations around the Lord and what he's doing. And we, when we do, uh, it encourages us to continue to walk and talk with him. Amen? That's how it works. And so are, are you with me this morning? Amen. Can I get an amen in the house of God this morning? Amen. 
I'm going to ask that a lot this morning. I just feel like we, I need to get you guys involved here because too much turkey can make you restless. <laughs> so again, reviewing what brought me to teach on this subject of wake up, stand up, and speak up uh, came from Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 30. I just want to review that real quickly. God said to the prophet Ezekiel, I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it, but I found no one. That's a serious and kind of heavy verse, wouldn't you say? I found no one. I was looking for somebody to make a wall to stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that you're living in because it was being destroyed by all these sinful things that were going on and the people were participating in that I should not destroy the land because of all the sin that was going on it but I couldn't find anybody to step up and stand in the gap Remember, the gap represents a place of weakness, vulnerability, and danger. The wall is a, a, a structure that protects the people, and when there's a, a gap in the wall, uh, it allows the enemy and all kinds of things to enter in. It's a, it's a weak place in the wall. I remember not long ago, uh, we came home from being somewhere, and we walked in the door, turned on the lights because uh, it was dark. And there were thousands of ants crawling all around on, t on our kitchen countertop. Anybody ever walk into one of those deals? And uh, so I followed the trail of the ants to see where they were coming from. And they would, the trail would sometimes disappear and there would just be a few. And I would have to reconnect you know, it was like Sherlock Holmes, where are these ants coming from, right? And so I would follow this trail, and finally, I found where they were coming in. It. And there was, uh, where the, the wall met the floor, there was a little tiny space, uh, and they were coming in from the garage, obviously from outside, through the garage, and in this little crack, this gap in the wall, and they would come in, and then they were attacking some little crumbs that were left on the countertop. So I grabbed that can of that famous stuff called Black Flag Ant Spray, and I let those little guys have it. I went to the hole, the gap and where they were in, and I squirted that full and full and full, and I kept squirting full of that poison, and, and guess what? They stopped coming in. <laughs> I filled the gap. And then I proceeded to zap those little guys that were in the house, and I, I just totally wiped them out. They were the enemy that came in, <laughs> broke in through the wall, yeah. right? Yeah. And, 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 and Zappo, I got them. And so I stood in the gap, so to speak. Are you guys following me? <laughs> so listen, there could be a gap in your marriage. There could be a gap uh, in a relationship with a child or a grandchild or many other areas of your life. There can be gaps that you need to fill. Uh, but in reference to this particular scripture, the people of God had turned away from God and they fell into every type of sin imaginable. The nation of the Israelites was overcome by sinful men and women who stopped worshiping the one true God. And so God goes on to say in verse 31, Therefore I have poured out my indignation on them, and I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath, and I have recompensed their deeds on their own heads, says the Lord God. I believe America is experiencing an Ezekiel 22, 30, 31 moment Amen. right now. And God is definitely looking for his people, the children of God, to wake up, to stand up and speak up, yeah. to run to the wall, he's asking us. 
and stand in the gap for God before America is completely overtaken by these ants. And the ants represent wickedness and sinfulness. Are you guys with me? So the evil people that are destroying our children and what they are teaching them in the public school system by taking away parental rights and by removing everything and anything that stands for God in his righteous ways from the public square. That's what the ants do. They just swarm in, man, and they take over. And they eat every good thing away. Right? And so, but praise be to God that when we read our Bibles every day, we find men and women that got sick and tired of being sick and tired of this tyrannical influence in governments taking away their rights to worship the, the only one true God. They got tired of it. Daniel was one of them. And so 1 Timothy 2.5 says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Praise God for Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. And if we don't start waking up and standing up and speaking up, you guys, for him, I believe we will see a full force of him pouring out his indignation upon America. We're, we're seeing uh, bits and pieces of it right now to wake us up. He's trying to show us what's going on and that we need to wake up. And then once we're woken up, we need to stand up for God. We need to run to the wall, fill the gap, and speak up and prevent the enemy from entering into our nation and overtaking it with all this sinful junk. So he's releasing these bits and pieces of it, right, of it right now, of his wrath, in order to wake us up that we might see what's going on. <clears throat> now, Daniel, the prophet, was just a, a teenager when first introduced in the book of Daniel, and he was an old man by the end of the book of Daniel. And yet, through Daniel's entire life, if you read that whole book, uh, you'll, you'll notice that Daniel uh, never wavered in his faith towards God. Daniel means God is my judge in the Hebrew language. However, the Babylonians, when they captured him, now listen, when the Babylonians captured him from Judah, uh, they, 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 they changed his name. They changed his Hebrew name at, because they wanted to wipe out his identification. They wanted to uh, wipe his mind clean of his uh, identification of where he grew up uh, in his life before he was taken captive. Sound familiar with what's going on in America? Tearing down historical statues, removing important things from our history books, and they changed Daniel's Hebrew name, and they gave him a new name, Belteshazzar. Change his name. Forget who you were, Daniel. This is who we want you to be now. In many ways, it's called brainwashing. Now, early in Daniel's training, uh, and Nebuch Nebuchadnezzar was trying to reprogram him from his Hebrew godly upbringing, and they wanted him to eat the king's rich uh, foods and drink the king's, king's fancy wine. But Daniel and his Hebrew friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you guys know the story, uh, chose to eat vegetables and drink water. And so at the end of this training period, these young men were healthier than the others who ate the king's delicacies. You good Bible students remember that story. His meats, they, you know, his fancy meats and uh, they drank his good wine and were, were allowed to continue. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and, and Daniel, they were allowed to continue with their Jewish diet because when they were inspected, they looked healthier than those that were eating all this stuff that the king provided. So Daniel and the other three boys didn't bow down and agree to follow the king's program. Pastor Jim, you mean Romans 13, 1 and 2? where it says, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God 
Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. Well, of course, it hadn't been written yet when Daniel disobeyed uh, King Nebuchadnezzar, but our God is a God that never changes. According to Malachi 3.6, the Bible says, For I am the Lord, and I change not. And then again in Hebrews chapter 13, the 8th verse, it says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Here's the point that I'm trying to make, you guys. If God is always the same, now listen, and he never changes, then that means we can always count on him, right? There's nothing worse than a, a person that's always changing things right? You, you just never know what ends up, do you? But with God, he is consistent and as solid as they come. Never changing. What he says, he stands on it, and that's the way it is. And so if Romans 13, 1 and 2 is true, why did he let Daniel off the hook for not obeying King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon if we are to obey the governing authorities. Why did he let him off the hook? He didn't didn't bow to Nebuchadnezzar when he sent out his decrees. He, He didn't bow to Nebuchadnezzar to eat the king's fancy foods. When the authorities try to make someone do something that is against God's principles, then we obey God's principles first. I believe that's why Romans 13, 1b says this first, for there is no authority except from God. And then it goes on to say, to obey the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God. He, he, He is the top authority, you guys. He is number uno, numero uno, amen? He's the guy. He's the one. He's the man that we obey. His authority supersedes. His authority trumps every other authority. So we are to obey the governing authorities because without them, without rules and regulations to follow, there would be total chaos. If there were no traffic lights in our community, there would be an accident on every street corner. If there were no crosswalks, people would be getting run over by cars every day. So there's certain rules and regulations that government has put in place that we're to follow. But if the government tries to supersede what God says in his word, then we obey God first. For there is no authority except from God. And that's why instead of Daniel... Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego bringing judgment instead of God bringing judgment on themselves or instead of them bringing judgment on themselves for disobeying Nebuchadnezzar, the opposite happened and they were rewarded by God and found favor with the king Nebuchadnezzar. Are you with me, church? Can, Can I get an amen in the house of God this morning? Praise God. Hallelujah. So it was when, the, when, God, when that God gave Daniel the ability to interpret the visions and the dreams that uh, King Neb- Nebuchadnezzar had, before long, Daniel was explaining the dreams of King Neb- Nebuchadnezzar. God gave him the ability to do that. God promoted him for taking a stand for God, for speaking out for God. And in Daniel chapter 2, King Nebuchadnezzar's call, calls all the wise magicians and the astrologers, the sorcerers, the Chaldeans to tell the king his dream and the interpretation of it, and none of them could do it, so he has them all killed. None of them could do it. In fact, they didn't even want to attempt to tell him what his dream was all about. And so Daniel gets wind of it, and he lets a man by the name of Ariach. Uh, who was the captain of the king's guard, know that he knows the dream. 
God told him the dream that King Nebuchadnezzar had. And, and he tells the, the captain of the king's guard that, hey, I know, I, know the dream, I know what the dream was. Let me talk to King Nebuchadnezzar. I not only know what the dream was, I'll give him the interpretation of it as well. And so, and so Daniel gets wind of this, and, and so this guy takes him to King Nebuchadnezzar, and in verse 26, uh, it says this, the king said to Daniel, whose new name was Belshazzar, are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen and its interpretation? And then Daniel replies in verses 27 through 30, and here's what he says. There are no wise men, enchanters, magicians, fortune tellers, who can reveal the king's secret, but there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets, and he and he has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in the future. Now I will tell you your dream and the visions you saw as you lay on your bed. In verse 29, it says, While your majesty was sleeping, you dreamed about coming events. He who reveals secrets has shown you what is going to happen. And it is not because I am wiser than anyone else that I know the secret of your dream, but because God wants you to understand what was in your heart. And so if you continue uh, to read that on your own, you're going to see that Daniel describes in detail uh, what Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream. It's, a, it's phenomenal. And, and, and so there, there, verses 37 through 45, let's look at those. And here's what it says. Uh, and this is the interpretation of of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. First, he, he tells him what the dream was. And now, in these verses, we're going to see uh, the interpretation of it. And he says, There is no wise men, enchanters, magicians, and fortune tellers. Did I already read that? Okay. Fortune tellers who can reveal the king's secret. But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets, and he has known King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in the future. Now I will tell you your dream and the visions you saw as you lay on your bed. While your majesty was sleeping, you dreamed about coming events. He who reveals secrets has shown you what is going to happen. And it is not because I am wiser than anyone else that I know the secret of your dream, but because God wants you to understand what is in your heart. So Daniel refuses to take credit for his ability to tell the king in detail uh, the dream and its interpretation but instead, he recognizes that God should get the credit for this. God revealed everything to him, so I'm going to give God the credit. Again, uh, Daniel puts God first in his life. Now, Nebuchadnezzar's dream didn't just concern himself and his lifetime, uh, but it, con it went way beyond that. It concerned the future kingdoms of this earth. It was for the whole span of the future, so to speak. And Daniel explains how his dream, dream depic, depicts... <laughs> I, got, I got my glasses fixed, now my mouth won't work. <laughs> so Daniel explains how his dream uh, depicts each kingdom until the final kingdom which is when Jesus Christ rules and reigns forever. And so in verse 44, Daniel says, During the reigns of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed or conquered. It will crush all the kingdoms into nothingness, and it will stand forever. Amen. Wow. That's good news. Amen? Amen? And so this is the kingdom that we are all waiting for. Praise God. And then if you go on to verses 46 through 49, it says, Then King Nebuchadnezzar threw himself down before Daniel and worshipped him. Now the king's worshipping Daniel. And he commanded his people to offer sacrifices and burn sweet incense before him. The king said to Daniel, Truly, your God is the greatest of gods. How many would say amen to that? And the Lord over kings 
a revealer of mysteries, for you have been able to reveal this secret. Verse 48, then the king appointed Daniel to a high position. Here he gets appointed to even a higher position. God gives him more favor with the king to a higher position and gave him many valuable gifts. So he made Daniel ruler over the whole province of Babylon as well as chief over all his wise men. At Daniel's request, the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to be in charge of all the affairs of the province of Babylon while Daniel remained in the king's court. Amazing. Now listen very carefully, you guys. Daniel got promoted by God because he took a stand against most of the king's decrees. That sounds weird, doesn't it? He takes a stand against the king who's all-powerful. And he's, he takes a stand against him. He stands up and he speaks out and says, I'm not going to go with the flow of what you're saying. And it turns out that Nebuchadnezzar's eyes are opened through various things that happened. One of them is this dream that Daniel was able to interpret. So through these various things that happen, uh, Nebuchadnezzar's eyes are open, and now he starts praising God. Daniel's God, the only true God. He recognizes that Daniel's God is better than all the gods that he's been worshiping. Amen. Because all of his sorcerers, all of his prophets, all of his people that would come to him and speak falsely, just to tickle his ears, could not do what Daniel did because only God could give Daniel the interpretation of the dream. And Daniel gives God the credit for it. And so God honors what Daniel did because he stood up for God and now he gets promoted to even a higher position. Daniel was all about God. He stood strong when the gates of hell tried to prevail against everything he believed in. He never bowed to conform to the ways of the world. And because of that, God rewarded him with greatness and all kinds of riches. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. He says, enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life. There are few who find it. My friends, I don't need to tell you that we are living in a day that Daniel spoke about while interpreting Nebuchadnezzar's dream. We're living in that day at the end of the dream that Daniel interpreted. In Daniel 2, verse 20, 43, here's what it says. It says, The mixture of iron and clay also shows that these kingdoms will try to strengthen themselves by forming alliances with each other, by mixing people one with another, but they will not hold together just as iron and clay do not mix. Mm. Let me tell you what that means. We see this today. More than two genders, our children are being taught. God says, I created man in my image, male and female. But the world wants to make our kids believe that there's multiple genders. God must have made some kind of mistake. There's, you can be whatever you want to be. You, you, you go to the restrooms. And it says, multi-gender bathroom. Well, what the heck is that? <laughs> you don't know what's going to be in there when you open the door. <laughs> so we also see open borders. But they will not hold together just as iron and clay do not mix. We see open borders. We see 
all kinds of people from everywhere, every direction coming into our country, all kinds of belief systems. You know, why is it that in America you have to wear, or you're supposed to wear mask and get vaccinated, but we can let people in by the droves that don't have to? Does that make sense? One world government. The United Nations. The G7 summit. Coexist on bumper stickers on all kinds of cars. All these things were prophesied about in the Old Testament. All these things were part of Nebuchadnezzar's dream that Daniel interpreted. It doesn't mention their names, but their purpose it mentions. And their purpose is to set things up for the Antichrist to come in and rule over every people of every nation. But God, the good news is, is, is found in Daniel chapter 2, verse 44. And here's what it says. During the reigns of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed or conquered. It will crush all these kingdoms into nothingness, and it will stand forever. Come on, church. Let me hear you say amen. Flashing lights, honking horns. You should be shouting on that praise and praising God. Amen? So what do we do in the meantime? We are to wake up. We're to stand up. We're to speak up. Matthew 5, 13 through 16, it says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? I got some French fries the other day, and they didn't give me any salt. Now, how many of you eat French fries with no salt on them? And if you're on a special diet, then Okay. <laughs> They don't taste nearly as good as if you put a little salt on them, I guarantee you. So if you, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled under the foot by men. Back in Jesus' day, they used salt as a preservative, and they would rub it on the meat, and it would preserve the meat. So there was salt in the home all the time. But if that salt sat around for way too long... It would lose its, its flavor. It would lose its value. So the people would take that old salt, they would throw it out on the dirt road in front of their house, and it would just get walked on and trampled on. It was good for nothing. And that's what Jesus is explaining here. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing, but thrown out and trampled under the foot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. In other words, they put that up high so that if it's up high, then that light will light up the whole room. But if it's down low, it's just the, the circumference of that light will be much smaller. Amen? So, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand. And it gives <coughs> light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. See, that's what Daniel did. He let his light shine. He was the salt of the earth. And he let his light shine so that it would glorify not him but his father which was in heaven and God rewarded him for that amen? amen and that's what Daniel did and that's what you and I are supposed to do let me finish up with this as born again believers we are not to be conformed as Romans 12 2 says to this world but to be transformed amen and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. In other words, wake up. By the renewing of your mind that you may prove, stand up. What is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God? Speak up. 
We are not to be a bunch of rebellious people. That's not what I'm teaching here. But we are, are not to allow ourselves to be conformed to the world's ways of thinking. And sometimes we need to go against the flow. I think there's a slide up there. Uh, can you put that next one up? Yeah. You got one fish there being the light, and he's going against the flow. I saw that, and I had to, I had to show you guys that picture. Amen. I'm going to have the worship team come on up and get ready as I close out. Don't be conformed. Don't be conformed to the world. We are to live in the world but we're not to be conformed to the world in its ways. We're not to be rebellious people running around, burning down buildings, looting buildings. We're not to be rebellious. We're to follow uh, normal rules and regulations so that there is no lawlessness in the land. But, but if one of, the, one of these people that are in charge tries to make us to do something that is against the principles of God, then we go to the book. Amen. And we search the scripture as the Bereans told us to do daily, and we find out if that is true. If this is, what, is this what God wants us to do, or is this what man wants us to do? And if it goes against the principles of God, then we stand on the word of God, and God will honor that in your life because you're bringing glory to him. And he will do with you as he did to Daniel and so many others that are in the scriptures. That's what he will do. That's, that's God's nature. Amen. That's what God does. Amen, church? Amen. He is a good God. Yes. He is a great God. Yes. And he loves you. And man, there is a force of darkness out there in the world right now that is trying to destroy every good thing that God has is trying to accomplish. Yes. Now, is that force mightier than God? No, no, absolutely not. God proved that when he cast Lucifer out of heaven. And the Bible says that he went down so fast, it, it, he was like, it was like a lightning bolt, and he hit the ground. Boom. When Jesus died, and the Bible teaches us that he died. He descended into hell, and he took the keys of death, hell, and the grave. He made a mockery out of Satan and all of his cohorts, and he took those keys, and he shot up back out of there. It's called the resurrected life. Amen. And he shot up out of there after he made a mockery of Satan and those. When Jesus walked out to the pit after fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, and he walked out to the pinnacle uh, uh, of, of, the, of, the, uh, of the temple, and Satan addressed him and tried to get him to uh, eat and said, this is my kingdom. You could have it all if you'll just bow to me and deny your God. And Jesus said, what? Get behind thee, Satan. Amen. Get behind me, Satan, for uh, the, the word of God is what I live by. The word of God is my bread. The word of God is what I eat. That's my interpretation of it. And that's why we are to read the scriptures every day. That's why we're to have quiet time with the Lord every single day. So that we can learn how to trust him in every area of our life. You know, the Bible teaches us that when uh, the, the storms of life come, how many of us understand that they do come? Sometimes they come in the middle of the night when you don't even realize it. And you wake up the next day and all hell has broken loose. Amen? But the Bible says that if we build our house upon the rock, when those storms of life come, and they beat against the house because our house is built upon the solid rock of Jesus Christ that our house will not fall. 
But if you build your house on some false pretense, if you build your house on some false prophecy, if you build your house on believing every little thing that you hear on the news, if you build your house on that, when the storms of life come and beat against your house, it's going to crumble and fall, and it's going to fall hard, and it'll be destroyed because you're standing on nothing. You're standing on man's doctrine. Are you guys with me on this? So we are to build ourselves up in God's holy word each and every day. Make yourself strong in the word of God. Get to know what the word is all about and what it says. Spend time with the Lord, talking to him in prayer. Fellowship with your brothers and sisters in the Lord. That's so important, you guys. Find some friends in the church that you can call. Get phone numbers. We're going to be coming out with a church directory pretty soon. And if you didn't fill out one of those forms, do they still have time to do that? Today's the last day. day. There's a little box out there in the lobby on that tabletop. You can put your name, address, phone number, email address on there. And, you know, you need to make friends and fellowship with one another. I was at uh, one of our, oh, we, we went, we had two Thanksgivings this year. We had one Thanksgiving the Sunday before with part of our family in L.A., and then we had Thanksgiving on Thanksgiving Day with our in-laws, or not our in-laws, but our son's in-laws and his family. And <clears throat> we went to, you know, Seth and Lorraine, we went to, Lorraine's grandma's house and uh, we were there with her and she, I was talking to her and here's what she told me I feel so lonely now because I'm older and all my friends have passed on except one and I used to talk to him every day and now I don't have anybody to talk to she's not a Christian that I know of and so when you get born again and when you connect with the church you should never be able to say that mm -hmm. because God wants you to connect yes. with people so that you can encourage one another yes. in the Lord mm -hmm. you can talk to somebody you can go have coffee together you can e even do stuff together and fellowship with one another amen, amen. does that make sense so I want to encourage you when, when the directory comes out. That's why I, I want you to, when, when we greet each other in the mornings, I want you to go to people that you don't know. Maybe you'll just click like that. Maybe you'll just say, oh, no, I don't want nothing to do with that one. <laughs> Not here. Everybody is so likable. Right, Jesus? Anyway, let me say a prayer over you and a blessing over you before we go today. Father, I just lift up to you these wonderful people this morning, God, and I just ask you that you would bless them indeed, that you would enlarge their territory, that your hand be with them, that you keep them from evil, that they would not cause pain. Lord, I, I pray that your face would shine upon them, that your hand would wrap around them, that they would be blessed in every area of their life. When they go in, they'll be blessed. When they go out, they'll be blessed. Everything they put their hands to will be blessed. I declare that in the name of Jesus Christ. And all of you need to receive it in Jesus' name. And let me hear you say amen. amen.